for God's word for you today is Ebenezer. Someone say Ebenezer. Ebenezer. Turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 7. 1 Samuel. Julia, how would you say Samuel? Samuel. <laughs> First Samuel. <laughs> I'm from far away, that's why. Hallelujah. <laughs> First Samuel chapter 7, verse number 1. Well, actually, before we, we, we go there, last week we, we talked about the five times more of God, right? And choosing to live by grace because there are certain things you cannot do by yourself. Somebody say amen. There are certain things we cannot do by ourselves. Even in the natural, there are things that we cannot do by ourselves. How much more in the kingdom of God, where we are now being introduced and being taught the ways of God. Amen. The, his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, right? So there's no way you can do the things of God with your own ability and in your own way. Somebody say amen. And so that's where the grace of God comes in. And you must choose to depend on the grace of God. Don't be shy about it. it it's, it's there for you for the taking. The abundant grace of God is sufficient unto you. Somebody say amen. And so walk in the grace. Embrace the grace. And when you get tired, lean on the grace of God. Hallelujah. First Samuel chapter 7, verse number 1. Bible says, Then the men of Kejash Jarim, came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. And so it was that the ark remained in Kerjath, Jearim, a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. They mourned and they cried for the Lord. Verse number three. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the, the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from amongst you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord, and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths, and served the Lord only. Verse 5, and Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray for you. So they gathered together as Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the Lord of the Philistines went up against Israel. And the children of Israel heard of it. They were afraid of the Philistines. Verse 8. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that, we, that, we may say, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went up to Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as below Bethkar. Verse 12, then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. And called its name Ebenezer. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Somebody say amen. Say Ebenezer. Thus far, the Lord has helped us. Thus far, the Lord has kept us. This is how far the Lord has brought us. Now, this, this is the simple background. Israel was... Um, Israel was in battle with the Philistines, right? They were, they were battling, and they were losing. So some people had the smart idea that they are going to go into the temple and grab the ark, right? And so they grabbed the ark of the covenant ah, into battle, and they still lost. They lost the battle, and the Philistines took the ark into their camp and put the ark of the covenant in the, in the, in the worship space of their god Dagon. Uh, by the time they woke up, they're going to be like, you know, like Dagon was bowing. At the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. I mean, the new authority. You know when there's authority in the house, you, you can't help but salute. 
those of you in the military, you can tell just by, by seeing, you will bow. And so they, the, the, the idol bowed, right? And then the people of Philistine were like, wait, this, this is not cool. All of a sudden, they started having boils on their body, and there were rats running around, and they're like, oh my God, it is because of the ark. We should take it back to Israel. So uh, before they went, they, they, they made gold. They put gold shape, uh, uh, gold shaped in the form of a boil and gold shaped in the form of rats. Packaged it, a clean cart, put the ark on there, put the gold on there and said, bye. <laughs> right? And so the, 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 the cattle goes exactly to Israel. It doesn't veer to the right or to the left and they're like, if it doesn't go to Israel, then we know that's not the answer. But if it goes straight to where Israel is, then, that's, then the offering has been accepted. So the, it goes there, and then uh, it stays there for 20 years. Someone say 20 years. Okay. This is, this is, this is very key. I, it's an important background information because the Philistines saw the power of God, uh, but they still tried to attack Israel later. The fact that the enemy knows of the power of God doesn't mean that he's going to stop trying to attack. And that's why you cannot lose God. The Bible says that be, be, be ready in season and out of season. Be thou vigilant for your adversary, the enemy, is seeking whom he may devour. So you must be diligent to be sensitive and aware of, of what the enemy uh, plans to do. Um, but when they, when they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle, you see, they, they, they did not... Remember um, that actually only the priest could do that. Okay? Um, but, but beyond that, they, you can be near the ark. You can carry the ark, um, but not experience the power of the ark. Because the power is not in the ark. The power is in the presence of God that came when the sacrifice was given. The power is in the presence, not in the activity. Or not in the object. And so that's what Paul says that having a, some are having the form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. You can look like the ark, you can behave like the ark, but without the presence of God, it is incomplete. Somebody say amen. Is it possible that some of the victories that you are expecting in your life are not manifesting because you are having the form of godliness and not a genuine pursuit of God? You are not seeking God, and you are doing the natural things of man. Because our year of knowing God, like I, I keep repeating myself, and I will keep doing that, is not in our righteousness, it's not in our busyness. There are people that are busy doing things in the house of God that don't know God. Somebody say amen. And so we will not be as such people, we will be people that know our God and understand his protocol and what to do. Now, interestingly, in that same passage, uh, when, the, when, the, when the ark came back to Israel, the people there were like all excited, right? And the Bible says, and the Lord struck them and 70 of them died. You know why? Because they looked into the ark. Only the priest touches. Remember, uh, is it Uzziah touched it? He was doing a good thing. He was trying to support it. Protocol. Someone say protocol. In our year of knowing God, we are going to know him. We, we, are, we, are, we are going to study how he operates. Because these are the guys who have seen the ark the whole time. They know the ark is there and they worship in the temple. And they do, but they did not know they are God. They were in the presence of it. But they did not have an understanding of what it means. Let's not be that people. Somebody say amen. All right, First Samuel chapter 7. First Samuel 7. Let's go to verse 1. Verse number 1. Then the men of Kerjath Jerim came and took the ark. Jump over with verse 2. So it was that the ark remained there a long time. It was there 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented before the Lord. Then someone spoke to the house of Israel and said, If you return with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the asterisks amongst you, and prepare your hearts and serve him only. Our God is an exclusive God. Someone say exclusive. Our God is an exclusive God. And before he will be manifest in our life, there are two things we must do. 
first remove the other gods from among you and commit to serve him only. Remove the other gods from amongst you and serve him only. And you have been in church a while to understand that when we say gods and idols, it is not necessarily the physical thing. It is about the things that you have raised in your heart above God or the things that you have put equal to God. If you are going to walk with God, our God is an exclusive God. If you're going to learn about God and know him, know that our God is an exclusive God. He says, my glory I will share with no one. Somebody say amen. Isaiah 42 verse 8, I am the Lord and that is my name. I will not give my glory to another nor my praise to graven images. You must remove them out of your life and then commit to serve God only. It is very hard to run carrying somebody on your back. It is very hard to pursue God and say, I want to know God and then have a desire for the things of the world. You must separate yourself from the things of the world. Somebody say amen. Repentance and saying, I am sorry, I am sorry, is not good enough. Repentance must cause a change. Somebody say amen. That means there must be a change in your life. A change of the things you value as important. If God has to beg you to pray, uh, there is something that is more important than him in your life. Somebody say amen. It is two part. Take the idols out, get rid of those things, and then commit to serve him and him only. Somebody say amen. Amen. Matthew 6, 33. But seek he what? First, the kingdom of God. He must be proton. Proton is first. He must be first, 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 first. God must be what? First. He must be the most important in your life. God must not be prominent in your life. He must be preeminent. Big difference. Prominent means he has a big part. Preeminent means he has the first and all parts. Somebody say amen. Otherwise, we will have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. So think about the things in your life that, that you love, that are fighting against God, that are fighting against the anointing in your life. Oh, God, use me. Oh, God, cause me to go forward. But you are not letting go of the idols. You are still holding on to them. See, one idol in your life, thank you, Holy Ghost, one idol in your life is your reputation. You love your reputation. The way people think of me, the way people see me is very, very important. Listen, you, when you come to Christ, you lose all reputation. Somebody say amen. You have no, listen, you are supposed to hang with the lowest of the low. Jesus hung with the prostitutes, hung with the tax collectors. Listen, he lost everything. So you can't keep your reputation and talk about, I'm a new man in Christ. Are you a new man or you're an old man? If you're a new man, then you must put off. That idea of my reputation, some of you will not even kneel down in worship because of your reputation. You will not lift up your hands. Even at church, you will not even do that. When you are at work and the Holy Ghost stirs up something inside of you. <laughs> Let it out. Glory be to God. I'm, I'm at school and I'm teaching and a song comes and I start singing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Ba-dum, 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 ba-dum. I'm sick. Listen, lose your reputation for Jesus. Lose your reputation for the sake of the kingdom. I have count all things by what loss that I might know him as a Pharisee, as a lawyer, as a Roman. All of that I have lost so that I might know him. So don't care what anybody thinks. Get rid of those idols. And some of your friends are your idols. Mm. Some of you are Shonda. La la la. Ta ta ta. Amen. Some of your friends in your life are an idol. God, they keep you. You worship them. I cannot do anything without you. Don't leave me. You are that you are. No, without you, nothing. I, I need you in my. You need Jesus. That's all you need. And with Jesus in your life, everything is well. This is my firm belief, and that the answer to everything in life is in the presence of God. Get me into the presence of God and leave me there. I will come out made whole, answered, and delivered. The answer is in the presence of God. It's not in somebody or something. Somebody say amen. And for those of you who are married, your spouse is not your God. Mm. 
Oh, but I have to spend time with, let's, I got to spend time with Jesus first. And actually, if they want you to spend time with Jesus first, because if you don't spend time with Jesus, you are crazy and you are honorary. Somebody say amen. You know yourself. You need to pray and seek the face of God. And so wives or husbands putting pressure on each other, the first thing you must demand of your husband is, have, have you prayed? Not, not spend time with me. Go pray, because when you pray, there's peace in the house. When you spend time with God, you are, you are, you, you are more lovable. Mm. And, and, and man, this is husband and wife. <laughs> Amen. There's a difference in the atmosphere when we worship. When we are praying and seeking the face of God, laughter comes out of nowhere. But if, if you are not spending time with God, the house is always sophisticated, choked, you can't breathe, everything is done. You can cut the tension with the knife because the presence of God is absent. So stop putting pressure on each other. Spending time with me is important. Okay, I'm, I'm not saying it's not. But the most important thing is spend time with God. And then they will come and, 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 and when they are sweet talking you, hey, baby, here she got from darling. You know that that sounds like God. Do you hear me? It has a different flavor to it. Because you know it's coming from a place of connection to God. I don't want you to flatter me. I want to hear from God. Somebody say amen. So it is impossible for you, mm, hear this. It is impossible and it, it should not be for you to have a polygamous relationship with God in it. A polygamous <laughs> God bless you all. <laughs> Listen, I am an international Christian, okay? <laughs> I am a global Christian, okay? Uh, polygamous, okay? Polygamous. Straight up took away the power of the court. Uh, you can be in a polygamous. <laughs> You can't, you can't be <laughs> polygamous. A polygamous? Oh, Charlie. <laughs> I'm from far away. <laughs> you can take a man out of Africa, but man, you can take Africa out of here. I'm sounding like home. It's okay. Polygamous is fine. Okay. All right. So you can't be in a polygamous relationship. <laughs> And expect God to be part of it. Somebody say amen. amen. We are having too many relationships and we are just adding God to the relationship. And that's what many people do in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in India and other cultures where they have many gods. He said, do you want to receive Christ as your Lord and personal Savior? They storm the altar. But it is not to get rid of the, of the other God. They just add him to it. See, that is not the way of God. The people had to get rid of the foreign idols that are amongst you and then choose to serve God. And so you must separate from all the idols in your life. There must be an elevation in your life, church. An elevation where you count everything but loss, where you don't put anything else above God. Not your job, not your children, not your spouse, not your money, nothing. And sometimes you feel like you are being unfair or you know what, you know what, uh, they, they need me. And so I have to, no, no, no. What they need is a man of God. What they need is a woman of God. And your ability to meet their needs will be better and greater because you are spending time with God. Somebody say amen. Again, your friends, some of them got to go. Because none of the, uh, some of them don't, leave, don't lead you to the presence of God. Your TV shows, some of them got to go because the very things you are learning from them is in conflict with what God is speaking to you. And you leave confused. You leave confused. Every time you are confused about what God is saying, because on the show they say it's, it's okay, and then you are hearing this from God. There is that tension going on. Some of you have to get, get off Facebook. It's not good for you. 
it's not it's not good for you. I know people who go on there and they hear other things like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, did you did you see what Joe's wife did for him? You don't do nothing for me. I mean, you see, you know, all, all those. Uh, oh, I love my husband. He's the bestest things ever, right? And they put it on there, and you are like, mm -hmm, you don't tell me that. Now you are creating tension in the house that was of a of a Facebook post. And not everything on the Facebook on, on, on Facebook is true. Not everyone that says I'm a man of God and starts prophesying is of God. Somebody say amen. Because anybody can use charisma and speak anything. Like, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Don't, don't fall for that. Okay, now Facebook is a tool. You can use it to share with us. Is that anointing curvy? <laughs> Something hit you? <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a tool that, that can be used for the kingdom of God. Easily share the gospel, but don't let it feed your life. That you spend so much time in there that you, you haven't prayed. Some people wake up and the first thing they look up is their phone. And you teenagers, their phones are on. They feel obligated to pick up the phone at 2 a.m. Mm, is that not true? Mm-hmm. And they set it in a way that the phone flashes light. It's no longer the sound. It's the light. So the light wakes them up. That's, that's an addiction. Not of God. Amen. So stay your face. But whatever it is, separate yourself from the idols and commit to God because our God is an exclusive God. Someone say exclusive. He does not like polygamous relationships. Somebody say amen. Let's jump to verse number five. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. See, the Bible says that they, they drew water and poured it out. That was a sign of repentance. It's mm, digging out the water. That's my heart. I pour out my heart before you. So the same way they throw dust into the air, you know, ashes, and put it on them, and wear a sackcloth, it was a sign of repentance. They were thinking, uh, pouring the water out and then, and then pouring it out. Somebody say amen. And so it was symbolic of them repenting. Repentance is very important to access the presence of God. Continual repentance is critical to access Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, I get you. I get you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> repentance is very key. Somebody say amen. Repentance is key to a continual access unto God. Because not only is our God exclusive, our God is holy. He's an exclusive God and he's a holy God. He's an exclusive God, and he's a holy God. So not only is he not sharing his glory, he doesn't want unholiness amongst his people. Christians, we have become too comfortable with ungodliness. We have become comfortable with things that are not of God because everybody is doing it. And because everybody says it's okay. And because Seinfeld says it's okay. And because uh, Simpson says it's okay. And so you are following that. That is not of God. Unholiness is not acceptable. It says, be holy because I am holy. If we are going to know God, you must know that he's a God that is exclusive and he's a holy God. He requires and demands holiness. Somebody say amen. Uh, it, was, it was David that said that I will not set anything ungodly before my eyes. Amen. Separate ye from them and, and, and be thou separate and come out from amongst them. Hallelujah. We cannot lose sight of this important part of the gospel and this important part of our walk with God. Holiness, holiness, pursue holiness, for without which no one can see God. And so I want to know him. I want to see him. But if you're not pursuing holiness, you will not see him. Somebody say amen. You must pursue holiness. You must empty your heart. Lord, I pour my heart out before you. I thought wrong. And Lord, a continual, consistent repentance. Somebody say amen. Now, after a while, you, you really got to stop doing it. You done repented of that thing like 895 times. It's time to stop. 
<laughs> Somebody say amen. I mean, now it has become a ritual. And like I always say, oh, Father, forgive me for the sin I am, I am about to commit. You have done it so many times, you know that at the end of this, we're going to repent. <laughs> That's not good. Somebody say amen. Godliness, it is for your own good. It is for your own good that God says, don't do this. Don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Come off. It is, it is for your own good. So let us be separate from the world. Let us walk holy. Someone say holy. And, and, and holy is not, is not, uh, it's not gray. Holy is black and white. Okay, holiness is not, well, it depends on how you feel. It depends on the circumstance. No, the worst place to decide if something is, is holy or not is in the circumstance. Somebody say amen. Now, you can, you can go on and hang around somebody you weren't supposed to hang around with. Now, go out to dinner, uh, go out to, to his place, her place, uh, put on Luther, and expect that nothing is going to happen. You set yourself up for failure and say, God, give me strength. Is this holy? Is it not? Is it holy? Is it not? <laughs> God, he... Oh my God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Don't set yourself up and then expect to overcome it. Amen? It's, it's, it's over. I mean, it's, it's done. Hallelujah. The things that we set ourselves up for, don't do it. And especially when it comes to things that are ungodly that have, have been happening in your life, you can smell it a mile away. You know when the enemy is about to set you up. Don't, don't keep falling for the same thing. Pursue holiness. Turn around and run. Papa said that flee fornication, right? Flee. And, and my definition of flee is running and somersaulting and flying through a small hole at the same time. <laughs> I mean, I got to go. I mean, okay. Don't be like, well, you know, I pray so I'm strong. No. No, that grace is not sufficient. No, that's, that, that's going to take you down. Amen? It will, it will take you down. So run. Someone say run. Because you are pursuing God and you are chasing after God, you can't afford to have the enemy contaminate your life. Somebody say amen. I was sharing with the, with the, with the new members class. Our last class was today. And I was sharing that a drop of ink in your clean water, the whole water doesn't turn to ink but it is no longer drinkable. And the enemy is not, a, is not planning to take you out because you love God. He just taints. Just taints your testimony. Taints, taints your confidence. And sin is meant to disgrace you, right? If you look at the word disgrace, what is it? Two words, right? This, this means so the essence of sin is to disgrace you. That's why, you see, grace is the empowerment of God, the gift of God on our lives. That's why when you sin, you don't want to pray. Because the strength to move on, the passion to move on, you're like, uh, I'm just defeated. I know I shouldn't have. That's not the enemy. If the enemy can keep you in that cycle of I sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, he's fine. You become like a broken record. Stuck. And he's fine with that. Because you are no longer a threat to his kingdom. Hallelujah. So separate yourself. Pursue holiness. Set up very high standards for yourself. Okay. There are places I don't go. There are people I don't talk to. There are things I don't say. Set that as a standard. Decide way before. This is the standard. And I'm going to uphold it no matter what. Somebody say amen. Verse number seven. Now, when the Philistines heard that the, the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the laws of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard of it, they were afraid. And then Samuel says, you know, and he told Samuel to pray. He prays and he sacrifices. Someone say he sacrifices. The enemy is very, very good at attacking something at, at its infancy. 
and I shared this with you when we talked about redeeming my childhood. The enemy goes after people when they are children. He goes after your vision when it is small. He goes because it's quick. It's easy to crash it, and it goes fast, and the impact is greater. Train up a child in the way that he should go. When he grows, he will not depart from it. So whether it is good or bad, I can train something up, and when it grows, it will not depart from it. So the enemy attacks things when they are at its infancy. And so this is them. They have repented. You know, they're just, you know what, we are coming back to God. And the Philistines are like, we are about to attack. The enemy, now that you are going to that next level of pursuing God, of fulfilling your, your calling and your destiny, the enemy says, oh, oh, man, you are cold. But now I feel some heat coming from you. Oh, okay, so now you go and pray. So expect an attack of the enemy. It's better when you expect it because you are equipped. You're like, you know, I know he's coming. You watch and you pray. You open your eyes and watch and pray. Be sensitive. It is when you are all caught up in, oh, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, and then bam. You know, when it came to uh, Nehemiah, when they were building the wall, what did they have in one hand? A sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. When it came to Gideon, those who were sapping with water. Watch. Be alert. Somebody say amen. Because the enemy is plotting an attack. And I hope you all know that the enemy doesn't like you. Amen. There's no negotiating with the devil. Amen. Devil, I didn't pray yesterday, so leave me alone. No, no, no. There is no negotiation going on. The enemy's plan is to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. That hasn't changed. He's like a scorpion. He can't help but strike. That is his very nature. And so you must expect that now that you are pursuing God, it is okay when you begin to see attacks coming at you. I, I, I felt uh, such an attack at school a few, a few days ago, and I was like, oh, okay. And I just, I just, I, just uh, I responded back to my boss, this is nothing but a devilish attack on what I'm doing. Because I know I'm changing lives. God is moving. Kids are coming to Christ. Kids are growing in Christ. Kids are having their minds renewed. And I know that. And the devil is like, oh, really? Oh, so you are going to change and the course of direction that I have for their life. And so all, all this complaining, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that. You know, can't touch this. I'm of God. I'm there on a mission. And I have lost all reputation. I, I, I don't care what you think about me. I'm not going to stop doing what I'm doing because you don't like it. In the eyes of my God, you are nothing. Hallelujah. But expect it. The more you are spending time with God, expect people start to call you names on the job. Expect your boss start complaining about things that don't involve you at all. You're like, where is this coming from? Christians are normally flustered when they're like, you know what? How can I be serving God and the enemy is attacking me? What did you expect? I mean, seriously, what are we expecting? You are chasing after God. You, you are getting stronger in God. You are bringing that power from the presence of God into your marriage, to your children, to your job. And you expect the enemy to say, oh, I don't care. He cares. He doesn't roll over and play dead. He will fight back. Somebody say amen. To understand that you are in spiritual warfare. These guys were just happily repenting. Lord, we are emptying ourselves out. We are just going to serve you. And in the corner, the Philistines are plotting to attack. You are in a spiritual warfare. That is your calling. And come on Fridays, we'll train you how to fight proper. Amen. Irene, is that good enough? Is that a good plug? That's a good plug. Amen. That's a good plug. Hallelujah. As you grow in knowing God, watch out for the plots of the enemy. Rejoice and do not fear. Now, what did, how, did, how did Samuel respond? Verse number 9. Verse number 9. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it what, as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord did what? Answered him. The Lord heard him. Our God is an exclusive God. Our God is a holy God. Our God is a prayer answering God. Somebody say, my God is a prayer answering God. Say one more time, my God 
It's a prayer answering God. My God answers by fire. I tell you, my God answers prayer. When you seek him with all your heart, he will do what he has said. He is faithful unto his word. Somebody say amen. Our God answers prayer. And I want to encourage you in this. And this is, and this is a quote from my, from, my, from my seniorest brother, Pastor Prosper Asamoah. He said, there is no place for sacrifice. But there is a place for sacrifice that prayer cannot cover. And I was like, huh? Mm -hmm. There's a place for sacrifice that prayer cannot cover. We have misunderstood the verse that says to obey is better than, so we have stopped sacrifice. It says it's better than, it didn't say sacrificing was wrong. There's a place where sacrifice can get to that prayer cannot. Because prayer is about you communing with God, right? God gives you insight, and we talk back and forth. Koinonia, there's fellowship. But sacrifice is a commitment on your part to follow through. And so you are praying, oh God, uh, uh, thank you for my harvest. Uh, uh, I see the cornfields. Uh, uh, it is overflowing. Oh, the harvest is coming in. But you are refusing to put corn in the ground. Prayer is powerful. But if there's no sacrifice, why do you think they sacrifice all the time? Why do you think that God tested Abraham and said, Abraham, sacrifice your son? Wasn't Abraham obedient? He left his father's land. Has he not been working with God the whole time? So why then is God demanding a sacrifice? Because sacrifice means your heart is going to come. It is not about money. It's that money is attached to your heart. Or if I dare say, money is one of the idols in your life that you must put away and see God. You have been chasing after money, chasing after money, chasing after money. And so now you cannot even sacrifice it because you are afraid to lose it. Now I always say broke is relative. Somebody say amen. That is biblical. I'm just kidding. Broke is relative. Somebody says I have $2 million and oh my God, I'm, oh, no, I'm losing it. I don't have enough money. I, I only have $20 million. And for some of us, we also remember when, and your bank account is 36 cents. I remember that too. Broke is relative. You can't keep chasing after money. But I want to challenge you to a place of sacrifice. Someone say sacrifice. Listen. I'll go there. Married people. Those who are seeking to get married. There's a place where you can pray and pray and pray and pray for your spouse. Then there is that time where you get on your knees and wash their feet. You can pray all you want. But if you are not sacrificing... You will not see the fruit of it. And that's how spouses get mad at each other. You pray all the time, but you never change. Mm -hmm. I'm praying for you. Keep praying for me because you need it. Sacrifice goes to a place that prayer cannot because sacrifice is, is, is a full-time commitment. Somebody say amen. That was the the conversation between the pig and the chicken. A guest came to the house, and the, and the chicken says, uh, let's, let's give him breakfast. And the pig says, it's easy for you to say. <laughs> for you, it's just a little bit to, to give an egg. To me, it's a full-time commitment. Bacon, <laughs> he has to die <laughs> to give him breakfast. All the chicken has to do is drop an egg and still live it. Amen. Go with sacrifice. Listen, sacrifice provokes the heart of God. Sacrifice will provoke the heart of God. Listen, let me let me let me let me let you into this secret. God told me that Moses, my wife, the Lali, she's amazing. Someone say amazing. Thank you. Thank you. God chose well. Amen. God said that Moses, because of your willingness to sacrifice your degree, 
in order to obey me, she is the first fruit of your sacrifice. If you are not willing to sacrifice of yourself, always this idea of self-preservation, it's a demonic concept. I got to watch out for myself first. I got to take care of myself. Listen, it is not of God. So we don't share anything. I only have $5. I can help you. When we can get something that we can both share. But that's self-preservation. You can pray and pray and pray. But unless you bring the sacrifice. Look at this. I told you about the Egyptians, right? I mean the uh, Philistines. Let's go to 1 Samuel 6, uh, verse 6. Just one verse over. One, one chapter over. 1 Samuel chapter 6, verse 1. Now the ark of the, of the Lord was in the country of Philistines for seven months. And the Philistines called the priests and, and the diviners. What shall we do? And uh, tell us how we should send it to its place. Verse 3. So they said, if you send away the ark of, the, of God of Israel, don't do what? Do not send it. But by all means, return it with a trespass offering. Then you will be healed and it will be known to you why this hand, why his hand is not removed from you. And so jump on to verse 4. They answered five golden tumors and five golden rats according to the number of the lords for the plague, for the same plague was on all of you and on the lords. They, they brought a sacrifice, Jesus. They brought a sacrifice. I want to encourage you in this, that people, there are some people that have messed up church. Somebody say amen. But that doesn't mean that the principles of the kingdom have changed. Giving and sacrificing is critical to your prosperity. Amen. It is critical for you to increase in God, so you must be a generous, extravagant giver. Because that's how God did it. Jesus gave of himself. If you hold, nothing more will come in. But you must release it in obedience and in sacrifice unto God. Somebody say amen. So the fact that some pastors have made it a money-making business doesn't mean that you stop giving. Hallelujah. Doesn't mean that you forget the principle. Oh, I enjoy giving. And I was telling the class this morning, I enjoy giving when people don't know who gave. Come by, drop something off and run away. That excites me. The fact that I can be the hands and the feet of God to be a blessing and a channel of his, of his, of his increase to his people. I get excited doing that. If you want to walk in the prosperity and the increase of God, the abundance and the overflow of God, you must learn to give. Somebody say amen. Your tithe is the first. It's your, tithe is, your tithe is not yours. Say it's not mine. It's not yours. If Uncle Sam was to increase taxes right now to 45%, you would still pay it, wouldn't you? If taxes were at 45%, you would still pay because he would take it out first. But because God says, give it to me later, oh, no, I think about it. Right? When gas prices go up, how many of you stop buying gas? Because you know it's important, right? So you get it. Listen, there's a key. There's a key. Sacrifice. Somebody say amen. Now, from, from my culture, and maybe from some, some of, your, of your culture too, when people go to an idol, Right? Uh, a voodoo person, uh, give me an example, was voodoo, witch doctor, exactly. When they go, do they go empty-handed? But why? It's, it's the same spiritual principle the enemy has messed up. You must show something. And sometimes they, they demand a, a, a clean calf and, and, and a bird with just one leg and one finger. I mean, they have specific requirements that they ask of you. And the people are faithful. To deliver. They don't go empty handed. What did David say? I will not give anything to God that does not cost me anything. Sacrifice. I'm talking about knowing God. If you're going to know him and walk with him, he's an exclusive God. He's a holy God. He's a prayer answering God and he requires sacrifice. It will take sacrifice for you to know him. That means that you are tired. Holy Ghost, you sit down and you're, you're sleeping. So you wake up, put the Bible in front of you. But 
sacrifice. It's going to cost you pushing beyond your comfort zone. I want to be comfortable sitting in my nice couch, have my Bible and my coffee. Listen, you don't have time for that right now. The way your bank account is set up, you don't have time for that. The way <laughs> you can't afford to do that right now. One day we will get there where we all meet at the club and just praise the Lord together. But right now we're working. Somebody say amen. So if you're waiting for that luxury to chase after God, it's not going to happen. You need to sacrifice. There was this one girl at, at, at school that, that made me feel so small. We're just talking. Are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. Blah, blah, blah. We're talking. And she had, she, uh, she had come for Ojibwe One Tutoring. She says, oh, are you a Christian? Yes, I am. You no, know, I find a way to slide that in every single time. And then she was like, oh, yes, yes, I love the Lord. I wake up every morning at 4 o'clock. And I'm like, at 4 o'clock. <laughs> That's my goal this year, right? That's my goal to wake up at 4. And she, for the past three years, has woken up at 4 o'clock to spend two hours with God before school. And she works. I changed topic quick. <laughs> <laughs> I was feeling too bad. No, 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 no. Yeah, so yeah, about that X plus two. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's continue. But I, mean, I was like, she was, it, almost just about 18 years old. Pursuing God. And what's our excuse? I went to work and I came back. Or the children. What, what, what is it? There will always be something. Sacrifice. Sacrifice will take you to a place that prayer cannot. I mean, prayer is important. Add sacrifice and there you are. Somebody say amen. Mm. Withholding your giving will withhold God's revelation and interrupt his manifestation in your life. Verse number 10. Hallelujah. Now, as, this, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the, Philip, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them so that they, they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel chased them up and whooped them all the way up to beth Car. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Our God is an exclusive God. Our God is a holy God. Our God is a prayer-answering God. Our God is a protective God. Somebody say amen. The Lord will fight for you. Somebody say the Lord will fight for me. That's the whole essence of grace. That my daddy has the bigger hand. Have you heard that story? Did I tell you too before? Where there was a kid in the candy store and the owner of the store says, get some candy and then go. The child didn't do anything. And the father, and the father said, Take it. He says, no. The owner says, just go ahead. It's on me. Just take it and go. He says, no. Eventually, the father got tired and took some candy and put it in the bag and they left. So as we're driving, the, the father says, uh, son, why, why didn't you just take the candy like, like the guy said? <laughs> because I knew you had a bigger hand. <laughs> <laughs> yep. He can only take this small. Daddy, if you want more, let God do the work. Somebody say amen. If you want God to deal with somebody or a situation, let God do it. You stop being in the way. You have your little puny life like Frodo and you're trying to fight battle. It's not going to work. Let God fight for you because he is a protective God. Bible says that we are the apple of his eyes. It's a... Zechariah 2 verse 8, for thus says the Lord of hosts, after glory he has set me against the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Our God is protective of us. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. They will attack in one way, but they will flee in seven ways. Why don't you let daddy do the whooping? Let him take care of that thing. Stop giving people a piece of your mind. Right, Barbara? Stop giving people a piece of your mind because eventually you are going to run out of mind. Amen? Let God handle it. 
there's that place of just saying, God, your grace is sufficient unto me. Give me the strength to keep going. Daddy, I commit them into your hands. And God is like, I have been tagged in. Boom. Tag the Lord into the ring. Tag him in to do battle for you because he is a protective God. Somebody say amen. Psalm 144 verse 6 says, Flash forth lightning and scatter them. Mm. Send out your arrows and confuse them. Isaiah 49, 25. I will contend with them that contend with you. Stop behaving like you don't have a daddy. Stop behaving like you don't know the power of God. Because this year, today, you are learning and that your daddy is a protective God. So when somebody messes you up, be like, you know what? I'll be back. Go and say, daddy, you got, I got it. Okay, and move on. You are fighting in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But you are fighting carnal battles. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So why are you fighting your boss? Why are you fighting people? Make it a matter of prayer. Commit into the hands of God and say, Daddy, go ahead, man. You do your thing. And God will take care of your battle for you. Because when God speaks, it is thunder. When God speaks, it is lightning. He will use natural phenomenon to favor you and to move things in your way. Aren't you tired of fighting? Aren't you tired of fighting? I always say that, and, 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 this, and this is my prayer for everybody, but I always say that when marriage between year five, I mean like the, the first year, oh, lovey, 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 and then after six months, you're like, oh, right? And six months, you're fighting each other, and then two years, it's like, okay, this, this eye staring, this uh, blinking contest, who's going to blink first, you know? <laughs> you keep doing that, <laughs> you're married for a while. After year number four, five, year four, five, that's where the real person shows up. <laughs> right, start contending. After year number seven, or at least I saw it in mine, after year seven, you're like, I tried to fight it. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> it's okay. We don't want to fight. I mean, I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of going to the same. You get to a point, you must get to a point where you are tired of fighting on your own. I surrender all. I give it all. Let God speak to them. Let God convict them. And if God is not making it, if God is not doing it as fast as you want, have patience. Faith requires patience. Patience is the faith catalyst, right? You need to wait. Wait, knowing that my God is protective. See, if you don't feel that God will keep you, that's when you say God is not doing this fast enough. I got to handle this by myself. But when you believe that your God is protective of you, Listen, I, 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 again, I have this confidence and I pray that you have that too. You can't touch me. You can't steal from me and go scot free. No. I am a royal priesthood. I'm, uh, I, I am a king and a priest. You don't, you, don't, you don't steal from me and just walk around. Listen, it may take 10 years. You're going to pay for it with interest. And so I don't, don't fight people. Let them, let them, let, yeah, yeah, yeah. Glory in your, in your, in your, in your victory right now, glory in it. But my God will defend me. My God will speak and I shall recover it all. Doesn't Bible say that for our light and momentary troubles is working for us a much more exceeding weight of glory. So what feels like a loss right now is not a loss because my God is a protective God. At the end of it, I win. At the end of it, I'm always going to win because I am on the winning side. Somebody say amen. So stop fighting things in your natural. They said, Samuel, keep praying, keep praying. And Samuel sacrificed and prayed. And the Lord answered and the Lord protected. The Bible says that since that day, the Philistines did not try to attack them again. I'm going to jump ahead of myself. But you know, do you know, do you know when they messed up? In chapter 8. Just go to chapter 8, verse 1. This was not intended. I just caught the revelation. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now it came to pass when someone was old, he made his son judge over Israel, firstborn. Then the elders of Israel gathered to someone and said, Look, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. 
Now make us what? Make us what? God was no longer enough for them. They needed man. They needed an idol. Somebody they can worship and say, Hail King. Somebody they can bow to. Someone, someone who is strong, who can defend them. They soon forgot the protection of God. And they began to look at man. The same thing will happen to us if we have other kings in our lives, other queens in our lives, other people in our lives that are contending with God. From that day on, Israel defeated, repent, restored, defeated, repent. The cycle just kept going on and on and on. Hallelujah. Look at verse number 12. Let's go back to um, chapter 7, verse 12. Then someone took a stone and set it up at Mizpah and Shan and called it what? Called it what? Ebenezer. 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 Called it. Ebenezer. <laughs> he called it Ebenezer, right? There's a difference between a stone and an altar. Verse 17 says, you know, Samuel goes home and builds an altar. Right now, he took a stone. Remember the stone of, of Jacob where he poured oil on it and said, the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And then he called the place Bethel, right? the house of God, right? So um, he took a stone, planted it down, and said, this is Ebenezer. Thus far, the Lord has blessed us. A memorial. This is Ebenezer. Remember the victories of your God. It is very easy to look at the things of life and say, what has God done for me lately? What has God come? You know what? I needed this and he didn't do it. But you forget the day, the times where he brought about a swift deliverance in your life, a swift victory in your life. Remember those days. Someone goes home and builds an altar, but Ebenezer is just one that says, thus far the Lord has helped us. Uh, but I, 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 I would dare be confident to speak this in your life, that you have had more than one Ebenezer moment. You have had more than one moment where you can say, hey, oh, I'd be like Simba, Aish, Aish, thus far, the Lord has delivered. How far the Lord has helped me. And I believe that if you will go back and remember all of those things in your building of your relationship to God, in trying to know God, in seeking to know Him, remember your Ebenezer. Remember the days of deliverance on your job, in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, in your deliverance into, into Christ as salvation. Remember all of those Ebenezer moments. And I promise you, if you do that, it will be enough to build an altar. Ebenezer, 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 Ebenezer. Even the rocks that your enemies threw at you. Whoa. God called it. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Build it all. Every attack, every situation. Build an altar. Because the purpose of an altar is as a sacrifice, but also so that when your children ask, when your children ask of you, what was that for? You can tell them, those are my Ebenezer. Daddy, why do you worship so much? Mommy, why do you pray so hard? You show them the altar and say, those are my Ebenezer's. The God I know has given me every stone of Ebenezer that, is, that you find on that altar. Build an altar. Don't be ungrateful and soon forget what the Lord has done. He's a holy God, exclusive God. He will defend you and protect you. But I tell you, there are some victories that you didn't even work for. He just gave it to you just because. Remember Ebenezer. Thus far, the Lord has brought me. Thus far, the Lord has helped me. And build that altar that your children will say, this is the doing of the Lord. Somebody say amen. I have a last scripture for you. First, first Thessalonians, verse 5. I know you are not fully where you want, God to, where, where you want to be but I challenge you to celebrate where you are right now. Oh, somebody give him praise right now. Come on, give him praise right now. Thank you, Lord God, 
for where I am right now. Thank you, Lord God, for where I am right now. Oh, just celebrate. Open your mouth and just say, Lord, I thank you for where I am right now in the name of Jesus. And that I just find myself in your house. Uh, uh, Lord, you are moving me forward, oh God, on the job. Uh, I thank you, Lord God. I'm nowhere I desire to be, but I am sure grateful for this moment of Ebenezer. You have brought me far. Thus far, the Lord has helped me. Celebrate it. Celebrate it. Don't get so loaded up with, with the fears of life that you forget the goodness of the Lord. Our God is a good daddy. Our God is a good God. He's a mighty God. Hallelujah. Last scripture. First, first Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. This is one of my favorite scriptures. First Thessalonians 5. Let's begin in verse number 23. Bible says, now may the Lord God sanctify you what completely, right? I like the King James. Oh, no, this was the amplified. May the Lord God sanctify you through and through. Ooh. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. May the God of peace sanctify you through and through. Sanctify you completely. Because you are the apple of his eye. You are special to him. Listen, we are, we, yes, we are all broken in many ways that God is putting together. And so don't, don't, don't judge me for my brokenness. Amen. God is working on me. I celebrate where I am right now because I did not being for the Lord. Bible says that my foot almost slipped. Had I not considered that I would see the goodness of the Lord. My adversary, you pushed me until I nearly tipped over. But the Lord helped me. Celebrate what God has brought you through. He says, I will sanctify you through and through and preserve you what? Your spirit, your soul, and your body, blameless unto the coming of the Lord. And now verse 24, and this is where we end. Verse 24, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Faithful is your God. Faithful is your God. He is faithful who has called. And he is faithful to do it. Faithful to keep you from the Philistines. Faithful to, to, to answer your prayer when you seek after him. Faithful to defend and to protect you. Faithful to receive your sacrifice of praise. Come and say with me, the Lord is faithful. He is faithful to me. Just take 30 seconds right now with every eye closed. Just, just meditate on that. Faithful is he who has called, and faithful is he who will do it. When the enemy attacks like a flood, he will lift up a standard against you. Yet though I walk through the valley and the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for my God is with me. I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. Faithful is he who has promised, and faithful is he who will do it. Get rid of every idol. Our God is too good to share him with any other idol. Our God is too faithful for us to share him with somebody else. No more cheating on our God. He's exclusive. He's holy. He's a prayer answering God. And he's a God that defends his children. Remember that. Remember that. Faithful is he who has called. Faithful is he who has called. And he will do it. The Bible says, though we are unfaithful, yet he is. So not in your own righteousness, but in the righteousness of God. Faithful is he who has called. And he is faithful to do it. Somebody say, Amen.